Welcome back to The Bank Guide. I'm your bank guy, Colin, and today is another video in the 5-Minute Logic Expert series where I'm bringing you 30 tips and tricks for recording, mixing, and mastering in Logic in 30 days. And today we're looking at bouncing in place. This is fun. I love bounce in place. And it's something that is super easy in Logic in a way that I never felt like it was in Pro Tools. Maybe they've added it since I moved away from Pro Tools. And it's one of maybe my top features that you get when you switch to Logic from GarageBand. So bounce in place is basically just that it's gonna take your entire track and it's going to process it into an audio file with any plugins on it you have if you want it to, and with any virtual instruments printed into an audio track. And it's really fast to do, which makes it kind of cool. So what I wanna do in this video is show it to you how you do it, uh, the settings on it, and make sure that you know what they are and why you want some on and some off. And then the three main uses that I use this for. So let's jump straight into Logic and start talking about it right away. So the first way that I use bounce in place is if I'm doing vocal tuning, I will usually bounce that in place once I finish tuning the vocals so that I'm not using the processing power of my computer to process all those vocals while I'm going through other, you know, mixing stages and all that. If I only have one vocal, I might not do this, but if I have a bunch of vocals, I definitely do this. So the way you do this is you just go up to file, bounce, and then track in place. So my preference is to do a new track instead of replacing this track. That way, if I ever need to come back to anything I did, I can do that easily. So new track, and then when it comes to bypass effect plugins, here, I, this depends on your goals and what you're trying to do when you're bouncing this track in place. So this will in, leave on like a virtual instrument or something like that, and it will leave on flex pitch and things like that. But if you have like EQ, compression, choruses, a virtual amp, any of those things would be bypassed when you do this. So it really depends. If you are trying to bake those things on, then you want to not have this checked so that it will print those plugins on. But if you still need to mix the song, you want to have access to all of those variables to be able to tweak them, then definitely bypass the effect plugins so that they're turning them off so that then you can put them on the new bounce in place track. Track. Does that make sense? Okay, and then finally include volume and pan automation. Again, there's no reason in my opinion to not have access to the volume and pan automation later. So I don't wanna have it here. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I see people do is select this when they don't need to. And what ends up happening when you select this is that it uh, turns it into a stereo track. So if you have a stereo recording, that's fine. But in most cases, like a vocal or a guitar, you only recorded one signal, which means you only have one audio file. If you include pan automation, especially if there isn't any pan automation to include, then what it does is it creates a stereo file, meaning two tracks, a left and a right track, which means it doubles the size of that audio file in your session. It's a small thing, but if you do this every time you do a bounce in place, you are literally adding double the amount of space being taken up on your computer than you need, the double the amount of processing power, that all that kind of stuff. So I've never included the volume and pan automation. If you have and have a specific reason, please let me know in the comments because I'm curious when and why someone might do that. But yeah, I haven't. Okay, and then finally, when it comes to overload protection only, uh, or normalizes the option here, I do overload protection only or off. Normalization is going to uh, basically set the loudest point in the audio to be at zero dB typically, meaning that it's gonna turn it up until it gets there, assuming you record it with proper headroom, which is gonna change the volume of your track, of your audio on your track. So I prefer to have it either, either on overload protection only or just totally off. Overload protection doesn't change the volume of it, but on would normalize it, meaning it would increase the volume of it. So overload protection or off is what I highly recommend. Okay, and then we're just going to bounce that in place. Takes time, goes through the entire song, bounces it, processes everything going on with it. It can take a little bit. So we're gonna fast forward to when this is done. <laughs> And then once it's done, you just get an audio track that is exactly like your other audio track, but it has whatever variables you chose to have printed onto this track now. So now if I hit I, you'll see that it includes my plugins because it didn't process them onto the track. If I had processed them onto the track, if I had not selected bypass plugins, then uh, my plugins wouldn't be there. So one other thing to be aware of, but it duplicates everything here for me and then it mutes the audio on this other track and then I could just hide this track if I wanted to. Okay, so that's the first way that I'll do it. The second way that I'll do that is with a virtual instrument. So for example, later in this song here, we have a Mellotron, uh, a virtual instrument here. And I think it sounds really cool. Listen to this part here. All those lies I told myself, or the eyes of someone else. Kind of funky, kind of weird. Now, I noticed that uh, 
it feels like it's delayed to me and I wasn't sure what was going on there. So I bounced it in place. And what I found when I bounced it in place is that it was actually slightly delayed. So then by becoming an audio region, I can do two things that I'm doing with this mixed version here. I'll go and mute the MIDI version. So one, I could slide it back. I could adjust the timing of it just by sliding it back because you can see the notes here were quantized, but there's just something about the virtual instrument that has it kind of fading in on each note and that was making it feel like it was always a little bit off to me. So what I did is I just slid it back until the notes were happening right on the beat for each of the hits. And then because it's an audio region, I could use a fade to fade in the audio without having to do any sort of automation. So another reason that you might do this. Okay, the third way that I like to do this or third time that I do this is with my virtual drums. So. For example, you could use a producer kit, which is gonna bounce out all your drum tracks here. And then you could select all these tracks or any of the tracks that you want and bounce them all in place at once. And then that's gonna give you an audio file for all those individual tracks, which I like because then I can see, okay, I can see here on the audio file that this kick is hitting here. With a producer kit, it just has one either drummer track or MIDI form that informs all the rest of the individual parts. So I can't see what it's doing throughout the song, but by bouncing them in place, I can. So let's do that real quick. So we'll go up to file, bounce, tracks in place, now, you actually want to turn off include instrument multi outputs. I'm not exactly sure why it doesn't do that for the producer kit correctly, but for some reason it doesn't. And then bypass effect plugins, include volume automation is off, and overload protection is the only thing we have on for normalization. We'll hit OK. It'll take just a second. And then we'll get all of our regions here, and you'll see it creates new tracks. So for each of these, I can now see I have an overheads, I have kick in, I have kick out, I have snare top, I have snare bottom, and you can pull these and process them separately as their own drum kit. That's the way I like to do it. So basically put them into a track stack and treat it as if I'd recorded it live. But it's really cool because now I can see the individual kick hits, the individual snare top hits, uh, you know, everything going on with each of the individual parts of the kit. And I don't just have one MIDI track for the entire producer kit. So definitely my preference when working with producer kit as well. So that's Bounce in Place. Those are the three main ways that I use it. I'd love to hear from you in the comments below if there's different ways that you use it. Definitely let me know. I'm curious how people use these tools. As I said, those are the three ways I do it. Before you go, if you don't already have my six-step checklist to a pro mix, be sure to grab it. It's completely free and it goes through the six steps that all professional mixes have and how to do it specifically in Logic. If you've been struggling to get a mix that you're happy with in Logic, I promise it's really going to help you out and it's free, so nothing to lose. But be sure to grab it. I really think you're going to love it. And if this video is helpful, be sure to like, comment, subscribe and I'll see you tomorrow with another video.